Welcome to Breakfast with the Birds, a short version of the bird banding program that we had last week. I hope you enjoy. I should have brought one of our little bird friends, but this will be our bird right here. So the goal of this net is to catch birds like those cedar waxwings that um, stay up high in the forest. So when the birds are flying, they fly into the net and the net slows them down and then they fall down into what's called the pocket. Now I can't reach that. So what we're gonna do is we're going to untie, we have these ropes and there's a pulley at the very top and that's how we lower the net down. We have to untie the, the rope and then my friend Miss Ann's gonna take the bird out so all we have to do is lower it down like this. Oh, it's getting caught on the branches there. Yeah, just reach in there. I think it's in the next pocket up. There you go. All right. Nope, it's just like being in a big hammock. Actually, Ann, we might need to grab that branch or pull the tree down and maybe strip off the side branches. Yeah. The trees get in your net. Yeah. So the smaller birds. So these nets are actually not built for catching big birds. So the most common larger bird that we catch is maybe a blue jay or a grackle. Um, the, we have caught pileated woodpeckers, which are quite large. They usually get out. Uh, the bigger birds actually bounce out of the nets or their feet aren't small enough to fit through the holes and get caught in the net. So usually they get out. So good question. Here's another question. It says, do you bird ban in the fall too? And do you find different birds at that time? <laughs> Great question. Yes, we do it in the spring and in the fall. And some of the birds are the same, but there are certain species that um, come through our area um, only in the spring or only in the fall. So I'd have to get back to you on these exact species that are how they're different or the same. But um, yeah, we've caught, I brought my cheat sheet here. Um, we've caught to date 42 different kinds of birds and banded, 42 different species in the nine years we've been doing this. And we have caught 687 birds. That doesn't count the recaptures, so um, that's just, I added that up last night. So, all right, let's check our nets here. We're wondering if it's possible to catch the falcons. <laughs> um, yes, but falcons don't live in the forest. The rarest bird, huh? Uh, let me think. I'd say probably the, I don't know if it's rare, but secretive bird would probably be the Kentucky warbler. We've caught some of those. And actually, I take that back. Last spring, we caught a bird. I didn't even know what it was. Initially, initially I didn't know. And then I had to look, out, look up the books and take out books and figure it out. It was a bird called the Western Tanager, which as the name implies, doesn't live in Florida. I had never seen one before in Florida. Um, it was a female, and um, sometimes they show up, they wander during the winter months. And so um, they ended up in our net, and it was in the same net right next to a summer tanager, which is its cousin. So maybe they were on vacation together to Florida, or who knows. Um, but that's really, really exciting. That's the most exciting bird I've ever caught. Um, now up north, when I did this in Wisconsin, we caught different birds. So it really depends on where you are in the country. Um, so bird banders are doing this now. They're doing it in the east part of the country, in the middle of the country, and then also out on the west, west coast. So um, lots of uh, uh, bird banding projects are going on, and they all share data. We all, all the information we gather goes to the federal government, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bird Banding Lab, and they compile all the giant um, database of all the birds that have been captured. So that if someone were to catch a, a bird that had a band on it, 
um, they could report it to them and then they could find out, oh, hey, Mr. Jim, we found your Western tanager up in Montana or wherever. So, and they would let me know and they would let the bander know um, who recaptured that bird, where it was originally caught and, and banded. So that's, um, that's how we all work together to learn more about the birds. And the purpose of doing this is to learn more about them so that we can actually conserve them and help them. So, all right, so there are no birds in this net. If you stand back, you can't even see the net. Isn't that amazing? These are called mist nets. I think m maybe uh, Miss Ann told you that, but you can see how fine they are. And they don't look like they'd be very strong, but to a little bird that's flying in there, it's got enough slack and it's loose enough that it actually um, slows the bird down, then it falls down into the pocket. Um, I call it the hammock. It's kind of like a hammock. So. Fly from this side and fall over, or, ooh. He came from this side. Weren't we just talking about this one? No, this is a different one. A different one? This one is a type of warbler. I've got Alan one. Alan wants to know if it's a flamingo. <laughs> Ooh, you need to have your eyes Callum checked. Callum Cook. Callum, it's being silly. Wrong color. Wrong color. Yes. All right, so. Is it a jabber jay? <laughs> nope. Our friends are wondering. All right. Well, what colors do you see on the bird? I see stripes. There's no pink on it. I see pink. black and white. So that's a good hint to its name. And it's a type of warbler. So it's called the black and white warbler. Oh, look at him. Good guys. name. It's all right. Doesn't seem to be too upset. Nope. And this is a female, and I'll show you in the book when we when we band it how you tell the males from the females. Because some some birds you can't tell the difference. Like blue jays, the the more, males and the females look the same. These guys look a, a little bit different. Okay. Ooh, we don't want to let them go. So we're gonna put him in the or her go. Put, put her in, in the, the bag. bag. Yep. Timothy would like to know what is the rarest bird that you've caught? Well, we, we mentioned that earlier. It's called the Western Tanager. So let's bring this bird over and then we'll band it and we can take some pictures of it. Step two, you got to identify it. If you can't identify what kind of bird it is, you're not allowed to band it. You just have to let it go. Um, then once you've got the bird, you got to look. Luckily, I have this little cheat sheet that tells me what size band it goes, but I always check. So this is a black and white warbler. It says that it takes a size zero. So if you look down here, we have all the different bands. Um, different sizes are marked on the tops of these containers. So here's the size zero. See that? It says zero. Now inside, I have a whole string of bands. And they're, they're, each one has a number, a unique number. Um, they're sequential. So one, two, three, one, two, four, one, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah. So what I'll be doing is um, we'll get the bird out and we'll, the first thing you want to do, once you've identified it and you figured out what size band to put on, you always want to put the band on first because if the bird gets away while we're taking all the other information, at least we know what kind of bird it is, when we caught it, and um, what the number is that's on it. So, all right, so I have to be careful not to let the bird go. Family have Lots of friends who are saying that this is so cool and amazing. Oh, it is very cool and amazing. And you don't realize we're probably the only school in the country that has a bird banding project right on their campus. That makes us unique. That makes us very unique. All right. So one way I can check to see what size band, I use this tool right here. This is called a leg gauge. And you see all these little holes here? So here's the size zero. So I check to check to make sure this is the right size. Up, oh, that's that will fit on this bird's leg. So I'll use a zero. Now if I used a 7D, that'd be way too big, right? Or a nine, those would be way too big. The bands that I use the most are probably these over here. Um, 1B, 1A, 1, those sizes here. So, and zeros and zero A's. So the largest band size that I have is four. So anything, if we catch a bird bigger than that, I can't band it. So, all right, so now we need our band. So we only pull out one band, one at a time. This is where you have to have really good eyesight because it's, let's see, uh, 954, is that the next one? 
Well, it's right there. Yeah, 954. Okay. okay. So All right. So, let's see. Where's my little Nora pliers? Nora says that this spurt is perfect. It is. So, these are the special pliers that we use. See this little thing sticking up? That's called the pin. And see how when you open it, half goes one way, half goes the other way. So that's how we open the band, because the bands are a circle, like a zero. But we got to be able to get it around the bird's leg. So what we do is we put the band right on that pin. Can you see that? And then what I do is I open the pliers, and it opens up the band. See that? So now that the band's open, it's kind of like one of those ear cuffs, I guess, that some people wear on their ears. So, actually I might need to open it a little wider so I can get the, the bird's leg around, or around its leg. We've had several friends who have there joined just now. All right. What kind of bird do we have here? All right, so we're about to band a black and white warbler. And right now I've got the band in the pliers and I'm, gonna, I'm holding the bird's foot and I'm sliding the, the band. So I don't know if you can see that. So the band is right there and then I just close the pliers. And then I open the pliers and I take them away. Now look at that. The band is now on the bird's leg. It it's, can slide up and down its leg. It's not gonna hurt the bird. It's not very heavy, so it's not gonna weigh down the bird. So it's like a permanent name tag. So next time we catch the bird, we'll, re we'll recognize it. So now, now I'm able to collect information about the bird, okay? Now the first thing we were talking about is this is a female. So this is a good thing to get a picture of. We like to teach the birds how to read, virtual learning. So this is a black and white warbler. These two birds here are black and white. One is the male. The male has black under it, uh, right behind its eye. That's called the auricular, and then right on its throat. And it's much darker black and white. This one, the female, has kind of a gray right behind its eye. It has these little streaks on the bottom. It's not as black and white. This one's fairly black and white, but look at its face. So this is a female. All right, in a minute we're going to figure out, well, how old is she? And there's clues to, to look for for that. So this is a female black and white warbler. Now, if it were a male, it'd have really black streaks on its face. All right, that's excellent. All right, so now we do the same thing we did with the cardinals, but first we're going to look up, see what page they're on. Mr. 495. I'd like to know how you hold the bird without letting it fly away? Oh, that's an excellent question. There are a couple key grips that you use when you're banding birds. One is called the photographer's grip. Right now I'm holding it in the photographer's grip so that you can get a good picture, a good look at the bird. I'm holding its legs. Um, not, not so tight that I hurt the bird, but if it flaps its wings, it can't fly away. So I'm holding onto its legs. Now, when I want to band the bird, you saw me, I was holding it like this. So this way I can look at its wing and I can get to its leg and it won't hurt the bird. So that's the other grip that you use. It's called, this is called the bander's grip. All right. So now I'm just turning to my page here. Now we need to collect some information about this bird. Anne, can you put that back together for me? All right. So we measure, we use a special, this is called a wing ruler. See how it has this little metal thing at the end there? That's where you put right underneath the bird's wing, the, the fold or the shoulder, essentially. And then I measure the wing. So it looks like it's 67 millimeters long. So if you remember those cardinals, they, they were a lot bigger. Okay. Now the other thing I look for is, especially on a bird like this, this is a migrating bird, is to look to see how much fat it has on it. Let's say a fat of one. So what I'm looking for is in the bird's throat, just like you, if you touch on your, your throat, you feel that little, um, the bones, and then right between the bones, there's like a little hollow. That's called, and here it's called the um, furcular hollow. And so the bird stores fat there. Now if it has fat, it's, the fat is orange, yellowish orange, but if it doesn't have any fat, like the muscle is red. So I'm gonna blow the feathers away from that area. So I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but You can see it's a little bit yellow-orange, but it still has that hollow. 
So if the hollow is all the way full and like no, no hollow, then that would be a fat of like five. Or, and it, a fat of six and seven would be if it had fat like on its lower abdomen and under its wings. Um, this one just has a little bit of fat, which probably means that it got here within the last few days and it's not gonna go continue its migration um, for probably a couple days, maybe even a week while it fattens up, okay? Because fat um, is the same as like gas in your car. It's energy. So that's how these birds migrate hundreds of miles or thousands of miles. All right, so let's see what else we got. Okay, we know it's a female based on the plumage. We know um, what the last thing we're trying to figure out other than the weight is how old it is. So I can't just say, how old are you? Oh, it said it's told me to mind my own business. No, um, no, I am being silly. So I look at this book and it tells me um, to look at, for different markings. I look at the wings, like this is a good thing to look at. Um, can you grab that red camera there? Um, I don't know if you guys can see it's on the side of the backpack, the red strap right in front of you. There you go. All right, so what I look at right here, so these are the, the wing feathers. These are the primary feathers right there. And above the primary feathers are what we call primary coverts, or they cover. They cover over the primaries, right like that. And then next to them, you have your um, other coverts here. You have median coverts and greater coverts. Look and see how black those are. Those are black, and next to them, they're kind of gray. So this bird, let's, we're gonna look here. Looks like it might be, um, we're trying to determine if it's an after hatch year or, or just second year or after second year. Here it tells you for a female, after second year. Okay, those aren't black enough. So I think this is a second year. So we know it's at least two years old. The other thing we look at is these feathers here. See how they have white spots on there? We look and see how rounded they are. Now, younger birds have more pointed tail feathers. So those are the different clues that you look for. But this is one of the big clues. So this is a second year female. I'm gonna take a big close up picture, if I can, with my macro here. So we have some friends who are asking about the tags. Mm -hmm. They want to know, first, are they made of aluminum? And do you find them hard to sort? <laughs> yeah, they, um, they are made of aluminum because it's lightweight metal. It's very soft. Um, for birds like a, a, an owl or a hawk or a bigger birds like a grosbeak, um, we put stainless steel bands on. Or like a hawk, they put on what's called a locking band so that the birds can't take the band off. So these guys are not, their beak isn't, isn't uh, strong enough to take off a band. So you want it to be lightweight. So um, that's a really good question. Now a couple of cool things about this warbler. Look at his beak, his beak is, or sh her beak. It's long and pointed. This bird specializes, uh, specializes on creeping along the sides of the tree. And for a warbler, look at the nails, the claws on this. Much longer and more shar sharper than most of the warblers. That's because it hangs on the side of, of the trees. And it uses that long pointed beak to, to pick up spiders and other insects that it finds right in the, um, in the, the cracks of the, of the bark. So, all right, so the last thing we need to do is we need to weigh her. Oh, all right. This is great. This is my favorite part, Mr. Oh yeah, all right. So funny. Okay, so. And six go. grams. So this bird weighs about like two clothespins. But yet this bird flies from Central America all the way up to maybe Michigan or Canada to nest and then comes back. So it's pretty amazing. It's on its way back to Michigan, Mr. Jim? Yeah, it's heading north. It's heading north. We're wondering why is he so calm? Well, because Mr. Jim is a calm guy, I guess. No, I don't know. Mr. Jim is a calm guy. Calm guy. I'm just trying to get some good pictures. We're wondering if you've ever caught a parrot. A parrot? <laughs> Not here. I did in a, so this is a good place to get pictures of the female black and white warbler. So, so this is a migrating bird. So they, they live in forests. So this is a good place for this bird to be. Meters and centimeters. Okay. So the other tool 
that we use to measure the bird's legs is this one right here. This is called a leg gauge. So this is what we use. Let's pretend my fing pinky finger is the bird's leg. And you, wanna, you want the band to fit, but you don't want it to be too tight. If it's too tight, it can cut off the circulation and, and the bird would lose its foot. Um, if it's too loose, like this, it would be way too loose, it would fall off. Okay, so you, you want it to be nice and tight. So my leg would, see it wouldn't fit 7A, barely, and 6, it won't even fit. So this one's probably 7B would probably be the best size for this, if this were the leg of a bird. So that's how that works. Now, the bands, as we mentioned earlier, but some of you weren't with us, we organ keep the bands all organized in these containers. Some of your, I bet you your parents might recognize what these containers were. Now, if maybe one of my friends, Miss Ann or Molly, can dig in the box, find the big bands that we have. We're going to take a look. Somebody earlier asked a really good question. They asked, how do they put the numbers on the bands, right? How do they make the bands? So these bands are made out of metal, aluminum. Can Should be in them. Thicker bands? Uh, no, the, it, here, it's right in your hand. Oh. Right here. Okay. So the largest bands that I have that I can use is size four. So here's to give you a, a difference. These are the smallest, and these are the largest that I have. So the smallest would go on a little warbler, maybe a, a kinglet. Look how small that is. And that the bird's leg fits right through. Now this would fit on a blue jay, even this is bigger, too big for a blue jay. This would probably fit on a crow or a pileated woodpecker. That's why I got these bands. I didn't have any size four bands, and then we caught a pileated woodpecker and I couldn't band it, which broke my heart that I couldn't band them. So we had to let them go without a band. But, so take a look at these. If you can see the number, you have to print it. Now the bigger bands, is it right side up? No, it's upside down, here you go. Actually I have a phone number. So that's in, in case when the bird gets lost and it needs to, directions, it can call this number. No, I'm joking. This is actually in case somebody finds the bird or catches the bird, they can call this number. It's one, uh, what is it? One eight hundred three two seven band B A N D. And there's also a website here, um, www.reportband.gov. So if you find a bird or find a band, that's the website that you go to to report it. And they'll they'll give you a certificate. They'll tell you what you know, when the bird was banded and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, if, if the private citizens, if you find a bird that's been banded, it's usually dead. So, uh, um, but you can see that the, the numbers have been stamped into the metal. So that way the bands re last a really long time. But on the, the smaller bands, that website and that phone number is on the inside of the band. So it's stamped on the inside, the underside, which you can't really see unless you opened up the band. But these are pretty um, uh, lightweight, soft metal. Um, if you want, what we could do is we can actually weigh one of the, the littlest bands. Let's see if we can do that. So here's another tool. We have a scale, just like the scale that you, you weigh yourself, you stand on the scale, um, and it tells you how much you weigh. But this is a very little scale. Now, if we wanted to weigh, let's see, we're gonna weigh this container here. So right now we hit zero and it goes to zero. We're going to put it down here. We're going to hit zero. Now we'll put that on there. So 4.2. But if we're going to weigh the bird, we don't want to know how much the, the container weighs. We just want to know the weight of the bird. So when I put the bird in the container and then put it before I do that, I put the container on, then I hit what's called zero. Right there, I zero the scale. Now look at that. It says that this thing weighs nothing. Well, we know that it weighs 4.7 grams, right? So it does the math for us. It actually subtracts off the weight of that container. So now when we put a bird in that container, we'll only get the weight of the bird, and that's what we want, okay? So let's see how, um, let's see, I can do one of these little ones as long as I don't lose them. If I lose one, I get in trouble. I don't even know if this will weigh I think it'll weigh less than a tenth of a gram. So this is one little band. Up, oh, it weighs point. Oh, no, it weighs zero. So it weighs less than a tenth of a gram. That's so that tells you that you know the bird is not going to. It's not going to bother the bird as it's flying around. All right, we're going to put this away so we don't lose it. 
now I'm curious. I don't know if I can untie this, though. I'd have to cut this, so. Let's try a bigger band. How about a three? Let's see how much one of these threes weigh. So this is the second biggest band that I have, size three. Let's see. Up. Oh, it weighs 0.2 grams. That's not very much. That's not very heavy. But the birds know it's there. One thing that's kind of cool, maybe the next bird we catch, hopefully we will catch another bird, um, we will, um, as the bird flies away, sometimes the bird is like, the bird, the leg that has the band on it is actually dragging down. And so they notice that it's there. It's a little bit of extra weight, but then they, they get used to it. Just like if you get a watch or a new ring, you're playing with it all the time, you notice it a lot, but then after a little bit, a day or so, you don't even know it's there. Okay, you've gotten used to it. So same thing with the birds. So, all right, any other tools? Oh, one other cool tool that we have here. For some of the birds, we have to take a lot of extra, extra minute, extra measurements. And one thing we measure is the, the length of the bill or how wide the bill is. So we use this special tool. This is called a caliper. And you might, if you've ever seen a video or seen uh, um, on TV or whatever, the Animal Planet, you've seen scientists studying sea turtles. They have really large calipers that measure the length of the turtle's shell and how wide the shell is. So this is a small caliper. So notice it's measuring between these two little points here. So let's say I wanted to measure, let's say this is the beak of a bird. I want to measure how wide that is. You can see that the number goes up. So it's 7.9, so I, I go up, the number gets higher. And I go down, it goes lower. See that? So that's how I measure very accurately the width of this, this bird's beak. But it's not really a bird, there's just pliers. So anyway, these are special banding pliers for, for if we get a cardinal that doesn't have a band, we have to put um, stainless steel bands on because their beak is so strong, they could actually tear off one of these bands. So we got to put on a different, stronger metal band. Isn't, isn't the cardinal the bird that was fighting? Started? So a lot of people want to know how they can help these birds. These birds are migrating thousands of miles and uh, they need all the help they can get because it's a very um, tough, stressful journey and a lot of birds don't make it. They either get eaten by hawks or they run out of energy. They land in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and they just don't make it. But there are some things that we can do um, as people to help the birds. Now these are, this is something that was came up um, I think the Cornell Lab of Ornithology came up with this. And these are what they call simple actions, things that we can do to help birds. So there's, uh, I think, seven of them. So one of them is you can do citizen science, which means you can record the birds that you see in your neighborhood um, and record them on something called eBird. And that, that's information that scientists can use to learn about the birds. Another thing you can do is you can reduce your plastic use so um, you might have heard about the plastics when they get into the oceans. They hurt sea turtles and other animals. Well, they actually can hurt birds. There are certain birds out in the ocean called albatrosses. They think that the, the little pieces of plastic are, are jellyfish or shrimp or squid, things that they can eat, and they feed them to their babies and their babies can't digest a piece of plastic, so it can actually kill the birds. So try not to use um, plastic if you can avoid it. Other thing, um, drink shade-grown coffee. That's kind of a funny one. You can talk to your parents about that. Um, they're in the rainforest in Central and South America. A lot of the rainforests are being cut down and they've been turned into coffee farms. And the problem with that is the, there's no forest for these migrating birds to go spend the winter in. So they need to have um, intact forest. Now, if you drink shade-grown coffee, that's coffee. the coffee plants are grown underneath the, the big trees. So they don't cut down the whole forest. They just clear the bottom of the forest and grow a different kind of coffee. So if more people drank this kind of coffee, it would encourage the, the farmers of the sun-grown coffee to switch to start growing there and maybe plant more trees so we'd have more forest down there. That's another way you can help them. Avoiding pesticides. So things, if, if in your yard you have um, insects and things that you don't like, um, some people um, spray chemicals called pesticides and they grow, the, they, 
they, that can poison the, uh, the birds. It actually can kill the insects, but then the birds eat the insects that have the chemical in, in their bodies, and then that gets in the bodies of the birds, and that could hurt the birds. Um, another way you can help the birds is by using native plants. So when you plant plants in your yard, you can plant really, really beneficial uh, plants um, that have berries, things like beauty berry and wild coffee and things like that. Uh, if you use the native plants um, to Florida, it's much better, uh, more, uh, there's more food, more places to hide for, um, for these migrating birds. So you can actually create a nice little habitat in your own yard. Um, but try to use the native plants, not, um, not plants that are from other parts of the country or parts of the world. Um, and this one I mentioned earlier, keep your cat indoors. Um, indoor cats can't kill birds. So I know some people have cats that they've adopted that used to live outside and they're hard to train to be inside, but it's not impossible, you can do it. Or you can create on your patio what they call a catio um, and give the cats places to climb around. So make your patio into a catio and then you won't have to, um, your cat won't need to go outside to climb. Mr. John, um, did you coin that phrase? I don't know, maybe I just did. <laughs> so the last one that's a, that's a really big one is making your windows safer for birds. So if you have really big picture windows, um, the birds sometimes can't see, um, they don't know about reflections and they see trees reflected on the windows and they think that's a forest and they try to fly into the forest and they, they hit the window and that can hurt them or kill them. So you can actually put little stickers on your windows to, to break up the reflection. You can actually hang down little pieces of uh, aluminum foil or string or what have you to, to scare the birds away from your windows. Um, it's, it's a crazy large amount of birds get killed by um, hitting windows every year, especially in cities. Like when they're migrating through big cities like Chicago and things like that, they're following their natural path um, along Lake Michigan or uh, other natural um, sort of navigational boundaries or river and if they run it they they come into a city there's that's full of buildings with big windows and uh, also lights if the the buildings are lit up at night because remember these birds are migrating at night they can get confused and they they fly into the windows and in the morning there could be thousands of birds dead on the sidewalks around these buildings which is very sad so, um, and if you add all that up, that's millions of birds because there are billions of birds migrating back and forth every spring and fall. So these, if you can do some or all of these, um, these seven simple actions to help birds, that would be really great. After we've collected all the information that we need and given the bird a band, we let the bird go safely back into the wild.